All right, Mark 16, Mark 16. And we're down at verse, uh, the end of the chapter, really the end of the book here, uh, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they uh, cast out devils. They shall speak with uh, new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following amen. And again, we've uh, been talking about these last, usually this passage is called the Great Commission, and uh, it's not. It's a post-resurrection commission and a pre-ascension commission, and it's really not a commission, it's an expansion of Matthew 10, which is the Great Commission, and now he's going to expand. And we've been looked, we looked last time at verse 15. He said unto them, and to them is the 12 uh, apostles, and Matthias is in the room. Uh, they're in the upper room. This is, the, this is Sunday night, so the night of the resurrection and so forth. And he speaks to them, gives them this information in verse 15, 16, 17, and 18. And then... Verse 19 happens some 40 days later. And the integral, Mark isn't concerned about that. Again, Mark is very quick. He, he's portraying the Lord as the servant, Jehovah the servant, the, ser the suffering servant. So Mark is boom, 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 boom. And Mark is giving us a picture of the, uh, of the impact of the resurrection on the, the little flock, on the 12 apostles, and so forth. So we, we looked here, verse 15, he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is not a change of the message. That is an expansion of it. The gospel is the kingdom gospel, uh, which is what they've been preaching since day one, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We saw last time that, uh, the, the, the gospel of the kingdom, it's going to get moved into be called the gospel of the circumcision and acts by Peter and so forth. And really what's, what's happening here in verse 15 is in the earthly ministry, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they, they're limited in their scope of where they're going. Just look over at Matthew 10. Uh, hold, uh, just kind of remind us as we, we're going to look at verse 16. And uh, in next week or next time, we'll look at verse 16. And the next time, we'll look at verse 16. And then we'll look at verse 17. And it, so I want to kind of dissect the verses down so that we catch what's happening here. And in Matthew 10 and verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So their message, the, their audience is narrow. It's the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's Israel only. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's only to Israel because it's redeemed Israel that is the ones that are going to take the blessings out to the nations. That, that's why here, uh, in, in, back in Mark 16, when he talks to them here, the, the issue then is this issue of go ye, to, and, and go ye into all the world. Now we're expanding the same message, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The same message, but now we're gonna, he's going to expand their audience. It's here. Now it's here, and we learn, that we learn in Luke 24, beginning at Jerusalem. Then in Acts 1, not only beginning at Jerusalem, but then Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But the one, where the channel, uh, the blessings are going to flow to the Gentiles is through the believing remnant, the nation of Israel, redeemed Israel. 
So Jesus Christ, he's, he's instructing the 12 here in Matthew 10, but then in Mark 16, he's, he's expanding their audience. He's not changing. Now, when, come back to Mark 16. When in Mark 16, the little flock's established. He's died. He's, he's, he's going to leave them. So the little flock's established, and now it's time for them to go out and get on with the job. He, he tells that the parable of the nobleman goes off, receives the, the kingdom, and he comes back. And while he's gone, he tells his servants to occupy. Occupation. You got a job to go do. And that's the early Acts period. And so it's time to get on. Because the whole of the 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 whole goal of the kingdom is to literally rescue the Gentiles from satanic captivity. But in order to do that, he has to first rescue Israel from that captivity, and then through Israel, redeemed Israel, now they can go out and rescue the world. So there's, not, there's a spiritual battle that's raging here as well. So we have that issue, again, the gospel of the kingdom, and again in Acts 1 or Acts 3, Peter moves it over, to the gospel of the circumcision as they're now going to go out to not only Jerusalem, but now to everybody else. So then you come to verse 16, 16, 16. And he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, it's an, it's an interesting thing there. Belief is on both sides of the equation of being saved and being damned. So faith, belief, is the key element here. Belief, you're going to believe. If you believe the message, then what are you going to do? You're going to get baptized, and you're going to be saved. If you don't believe the message, baptism is useless to you, and you're going to be damned. So it's the thing that causes the, the consternation is the issue of baptism for most, so you didn't get baptized, so you weren't a believer. Well, if you bring this stuff onto us today in the age of grace, you just, tremendous turmoil happens and problems happen. But what is also evident here in verse 16 is the issue of that basic fundamental element of all time, no matter from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, is the issue of faith. And it's always been that way. And when you talk about time past in the Old Testament, or, 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 I'm sorry, when you talk about salvation in time past in the Old Testament, no one ever stood before the righteous justice bar of God on their own merit. No one can do that. You can't stand in front in, before a holy God. The only way you can stand there is because of Christ, because of the blood of Christ. And when, you know, Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats didn't get the job done. Why? Because all that's pictures and types of, of Calvary of the cross. So in time past, if you think about, look over at Luke 18. You think about what they, Luke 18, you think about Calvary, uh, the, the uh, scholars and all them, those guys, they, they say, all the, the saints of the Old Testament were looking forward to the cross. No, they weren't. They knew nothing about the cross. Luke 18, 31, then, okay, he, that's the Lord, took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood everything he said, and was happy to go. No, they understood none of the... They didn't understand a word he just said. They didn't understand Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. They had no clue. You, and you come back over to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. 
And you know what? So in the old, in the in time past, not only did they not know anything about it, but they actually argue with him. Uh, Matthew sixteen twenty one. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. So no, nowhere prior to Matthew 16, which, by the way, is Mark 8 and Luke 9, did the Lord ever tell them about going to Calvary. He began to do it now, all right? And verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto you. So what happens? One, they don't understand it at all, and then when he continues to tell them, they don't believe him, they argue with him. So when you come back to Mark 16, the, they, they were never looking forward to the cross. What were they looking for? They were looking for the Messiah to come and to bring in the kingdom. But the, so they, don't, they weren't looking at the death, burial, and resurrection at all. They were looking at their program. That's why the gospel of the kingdom, that's why when we look at water baptism here this evening, water baptism is Jewish, and it belongs to the kingdom program. It doesn't belong anywhere else, and we'll see that as we go through here. But the critical part of this is the issue of believing. He that believeth, and he that believeth not. So faith is, is the, the critical th issue, but it really becomes the content of their faith. And the content of the Old Testament saints here, by the way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Old Testament ground. Hebrews 9 says, not until the death of the testator are we on new ground. Well, now we're on the New Testament ground, if you will, because we just had the death, burial, and resurrection of the testator. But the bulk of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Old Testament ground, so th the content of their faith is different than ours. Our faith says what? Believe, trust, faith alone, no works. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, okay? Their faith says, no, I believe, and because I believe what God's word is to me, that now tells me I've got to go do something, which in this case is get water baptized. So it's the content, the but faith, faith in the word of God to you here in this moment. Again, God doesn't clear the guilty. He, there has to be a payment, a propitiation. And that has always been the case. And in God the Father's mind, thanks to the revelation given to the Apostle Paul, Romans 3.25, we now know and understand that on God's mind, Calvary has always been there. Because he, based upon the faithfulness of the Son to go and to do, to die, to be the payment, the propitiation, God, he already knew it was going to happen based on the faith of, the faith in, the faith of the Father and, and the faith in the Son to do what he's going to do, now we have the Calvary, the forbearance issues, and all that is, covers all that. So the basis of justification unto eternal life. By the way, if you use the word saved, salvation, we'll see here, shall be saved. We'll look next time at the issue of salvation. You have to be very careful how you use that word. Because it carries three tense, a past, a present, and a future. Past, justification unto eternal life. Saved in the moment, that's a sanctification issue. And then saved in the future, that's a glorification issue. Israel, when they endure, he that endures to the end shall be saved. That isn't a spiritual issue, that's a physical issue. So they, Israel has a package. They got a benefit package. And they have a physical salvation from their enemy and destruction and wrath. And then they have the spiritual side unto eternal life. So justification unto eternal life, salvation unto eternal life, is and has always been structured and centered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Calvary covers it all, as the song says, 
then here when these guys come in, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The value of faith is not faith. Faith is a non-meritorious system of perception. You had faith when you sat on that bench, the pew, that it would hold you. That, what did that get you? You just had faith to sit. So the object of your faith is where the value is. And what is the object of our faith? God's word. What does God's word say to you and I today in the age of grace? What does it say to these folks here? But when you read verse 16, the baptism is important. And it's critical to understand what water baptism is all about. Now, faith is the balance. Faith and then the issue of baptism. So, in Mark 16, 16, you will hear some folks say, it's not water baptism, it's a spirit baptism. Not, that's not what this is. And they run to Acts 2. We'll go over there. Okay, we'll go over there in just a minute. But bap, the baptism of 16, he that believeth and is baptized is the same baptism of chapter 1. So go to Mark 1. And by the way, we're going to go look at Acts, uh, well, we're going to look at Acts 13 and Acts 2 and a bunch of places. So just talk out here a little bit here about baptism. Mark 1, if you look at verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's the baptism, Mark 16, 16. Again, we didn't change the message. He just expanded the audience. That's all he did. All right? In five days, two days prior to Calvary and the three days of the events of Calvary, he never changed because we're Mark 16 is on the the Sunday evening of the resurrection morning, there he sits with them and he gives them. He didn't change the message at all, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is preaching the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sins. Now, the interesting thing about it is when John the Baptist preaches verse 4, he's preaching to the nation of Israel. Come over to Acts 13. Acts 13. He is not preaching to Gentiles. In Acts 13, Paul's, the first recorded message of Paul in Scripture, Acts 13, verse 24. Acts 13, 24. When John, now again, this is Paul speaking, verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hands and said, and, and there he, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. That's verse 16. Verse 24. When John had first preached before his coming, his, the Savior, the, Jesus, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. He wasn't out preaching to Gentiles. He was out preaching to who? Israel. Why? Because it's redeemed Israel that's bringing in the Messiah and bringing it in. Now, come over to Acts 2. Because when you read Acts 2, something's happening here. And... Peter is operating right where the Lord is leaving him in Matthew 16, or I'm sorry, Matthew 28, Luke 24, Mark 16, John 19. He's, he's operating in that instruction. Verse 37, Acts 2, 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said, repent and be baptized what kind of baptism would Peter be thinking? Water. Okay. And, I'm sorry, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter, he is saying exactly what John the Baptist said. Repent and be baptized, baptized here. For the remission of sins. Now, between John saying, you know, in the beginning, Mark 1, 4, and Peter here in Acts 2, a lot of things have happened. John the Baptist has come. He's dead. The Lord's come. He's dead. He, he's ascended. He's risen. But the message is the same. Repent. Be baptized. 
for the remissions of sin. That's the gospel of the kingdom. By the way, Peter expanded it here to now you're going to receive who? The Holy Ghost. John the Baptist never said, be baptized and you receive the Holy Ghost. The Lord never said that. But now that the, now that the Lord has been ascended and exalted and set at the right hand of God the Father, now the Holy Ghost can come. So the issue, the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin, that's a constant thing in their message. Peter adds, you're going to get the Holy Spirit now, but John the Baptist never said that, nor does the Lord, nor does any of them. Now keep reading, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, you know instantly when you read save yourselves that that's not you and I today because you can't save yourself. But save yourself in what manner here for them? Well, get out of that untoward generation. See? Because what's coming on that generation, that untoward, that apostate generation, God's going to pour out his wrath on them. So the sa saving yourself here isn't a salvation unto eternal life. It's a salvation from the wrath of God, from the tribulation that's coming, and that's going to fit Mark 16 when we get down in verse 17, 18, where they can drink anything and handle the snakes and do all that stuff, okay? So when you... When you think about this, by the way, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they, they gladly received the word, they believed the word, and then what were they? Baptized. Okay, why? Because that's their message. That's the kingdom message. So water baptism has an integral part in the ministering of the gospel of the kingdom. Come back to Luke 7. Luke chapter 7. So it's critical to catch and understand what's happening here. Luke 7. Uh, we just kind of went through this passage the last couple Sunday nights in Luke because it's where we're at. But Luke 7, uh, verse 29. But really, let's start back up at verse 24 because the Lord is talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. John, the, John has sent some guys up, some asked some questions in verse 19 to 23, verse 24. When the messengers of John were departed, he, and that's the Lord, began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? Now that's going to go back to Mark 1, Matthew 3, the beginning. A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Well, that's not what John was wearing. <laughs> he was wearing Elijah's outfit. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in the king's court. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is, none great, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Now, isn't that interesting? John's important, okay? But he that is in the kingdom of God is greater than him. See, the issue is getting in that kingdom. John's a great man. Don't get me wrong. He's, a, he's, doing, he's right there. But if you're in the kingdom, you're greater than he is. It's that future kingdom thing. Now, watch verse 29. By, by the way, you've got to think about John. For the first time in 400 years, the Lord breaks the silence by talking to John's dad, Zechariah. I almost called him Zacchaeus the other day. Zechariah. Zacchaeus was a little, Lee widow man, and a little man he was, Okay. And for the first time, the Lord breaks that silence. So John's a, and by the way, with John, you're in Luke. Hold on to 7. Look over at 1616. 16. I think we got to think about John. Sometimes I don't think we think about John the Baptist. 
Look at Luke 16, 16. Hold on to 7. We'll go right back. The law and the prophets were until John. John's the last of the prophets. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth in it. What's the issue now? <coughs> well, the law and the prophets weren't done away. Matthew 5, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. But now what are we doing? Now we're expanding the ministry to say what? The kingdom is now at hand. The law and the prophets talked about the coming kingdom, Daniel 2, 44 and 45. And the, now we're expanding it because not only is it, it's, it's been prophesied, now it's at hand. So when you come back to chapter 7, he's got all this about John the Baptist, and then he says, verse 29, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. So how did justify? Declare God to be right. That's what justification, justify means. How did they say that God is right? By being baptized of John. When they heard John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, they understood where they were in the, in the timeline of, of Israel's program. They're out confessing their sin. Do you remember Matthew 3? Please say yes. No? Okay, Matthew 3. Hold on to Luke 7. You, you have to have all this in your head when you're thinking about this stuff. You don't. I do. So I'll give it to you, okay? Matthew 3. I'll try and do my best to remind. Matthew 3, all right? Then you have, so you, you start there in verse 1. You got John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He's outside of Jerusalem. He's not a part of the apostate nation and activity in the vain religious system. He's outside of that. John is a Levite. He's of the priest line. He should have been in Jerusalem in the temple, but he's not. And saying, verse 2, and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we have an expansion of the ministry. All right? Verse 5, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, the confessing of their sins isn't, well, I stole a pen from work today, and I cheated on my test over here, and I stole here. That's not the sin. The sin here is Daniel 9. The sin of we have broken the covenant that we have with God. We have transgressed the covenant because we've, fought, we've gone after little gods, little Gs, idolatry, Baal worship. So the confessing of the sins we were talking the other night about 1 John 1, 9 and confessing your sin. It isn't, all of the, those have context to them. And actually, some in Hebrews, and especially in James and John, when they talk, it's sin, singular. There's, there is a sin that, that they're violating. It isn't their, you know, I hit my wife or I punched my husband or, you know, any of that. It's we're violating the word of God. We're violating the covenant. So they're confessing it. God is right. Now go back to Luke 7. What are they doing? They're justifying God being baptized with the baptism of John. They're, they're confessing their sins. They're, we've violated the covenant. They're recognizing the apostate condition of the nation. And then... And they're submitting to the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. God is right. We're wrong. Verse 30, 730. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Now notice how baptism is connected if you believe the message, then what are you going to do? You're going to go get baptized. If you didn't believe the message, then what would you not do? Get baptized. So baptism is it's very it's connected because it's the it's the identification, it's the identifying issue. Come come over to uh, well John three. We'll just jump in. Uh, on your way, stop in John 1. You see, it's, it's a, the, John's baptism is a dividing point within the nation of Israel. 
because it's used to identify the believing remnant, the believers together. And it's going to, so then it's going to, if it's identifying the believers, then what is it doing? It's separating the unbeliever, the fair, the, you know, the generation of vipers and those guys. Look at John 1, just a verse on the way to chapter 10. John 1, verse, uh, well, the Lord, verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the, every time I read that Lamb of God, I think about that figure of speech, and bad, there's a little lamb, you know. It just stuck in my mind. It was Sunday we were talking about the figures of speech. Anyway, verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. See that? Why was John baptizing? Why did the Lord need to be baptized of John? Well, that's going to be chapter 10. Come over to chapter 10. I know I said three. We'll get there. Just hold tight. You see, in John 10, we begin to learn about the shepherd. John 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up over some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, so to the shepherd, the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So think about this. The porter is John the Baptist. The door is water baptism. The shepherd, obviously, is the Lord, and he's going to do what? He's literally going to go through the door, i.e., water baptism, John 1, just as that little flock is. Now, when they get baptized, where are they? They're in, the, they're in Christ. So they're in the what? In the shepherd, but they're also in the door. And it, there's a complete identification. When he says there, I am the door of the sheep, that is identification issue. Because the porter's John, the Baptist, and the identifying mark here is the issue of baptism, and that's the door. John reaches up, opens the door, and the Lord goes through, i.e., John 1, 31. Come over to John 3. John 1. And he comes in the exact same way that the believing remnant, the little flock, was to come in. Exactly the way. He has to do that. So you know what he can say? God is right, and I'm doing it his way. And that's the Lord and in in, in who he is. So baptism is an, is an, identify, it's an identification sign of a group of people who... Were, who, are being, who were being cleansed, were, past tense, okay, cleansed, separated from the idolatry and from Baal worship, the vain religious system, so that, so that they would be that clean, cleansed nation. And, it, and they were going to do what? Save themselves from that untoward generation. Baptism is not getting them free of hell and death and sin. What it's doing is it's delivering them from the wrath of God being poured out on that apostate nation. All right, we'll look over in 1 Peter here in a little bit. But baptism, by the way, what justified them? Faith. We looked last time in Noah, in Hebrews 11. By faith, what did Noah do? He built the ark. How, that did what? It saved him and his family. Not, and that's a picture, and we'll get over there. I got ahead of myself there. Okay? Look at John chapter 3. John 3, verse 22. John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in, in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and there came and were, and they came and were baptized. 
for John was not yet cast into prison. Now, real quick, he's not in prison yet. We're in John 3. Remember what all that stuff happening in John up to John 3, okay? You know, the marriage at Cana, this, all this stuff. In Matthew 4, verse 12, the verse says that John's cast in because John, the Lord heard that John's in prison, and then he goes to Galilee, and his Galilean ministry starts. So there's a lot of stuff going on there before John, before Matthew 4, okay? Now look at verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Now, that's, quite, that's interesting. They're asking John, what are you doing? But their question isn't about, why are you over here you know, looking like Elijah? They're asking him about purifying. Because when the Jews saw someone water baptizing, they understood what it meant. They understood that water baptism is associated with purification, cleansing, cleaning them up. Come back to chapter 1 of John. John chapter 1, verse 24. And that we have to, that gets lost on some of the conversations about water baptism. The Jews understood when they, when, well, verse 24. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said, they asked him, John the Baptist, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet, Elijah? They don't ask him, what are you doing? What, what you're doing, what is that called? The Pharisees call it baptizing, baptism. They expected, by the way, if you're not that Christ, which is what they ask him back up in verse 20 and 21. So what did they anticipate the Messiah doing when he showed up? Baptizing, clean, cleaning them up, getting them. They expected the Messiah to come and clean the nation up. They expected Elias, Elijah, to come and to clean them up, to separate that nation out. They understood some things. They didn't just look, oh, I wonder what they're doing down there getting wet for. They understood it. So the issue of water baptism for the nation of Israel, they understood it. The Jews understood it to be, to be about, come, come with me to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. They understood it to be about purification. Now, it's us dumb, thump Gentile people that try to make it into all this other stuff. But it's real clear what baptism is, and it's for the purification, for the cleansing of the nation. Ezekiel 36 you have an, an expand. You have an ex, an exposition on the new covenant. Okay, now we don't have the time, and I would encourage you to read all of chapter thirty six because it's about the Lord judging Israel. But if you look at verse twenty two, by the way, Jeremiah thirty one, thirty one to thirty four. Again, read the whole chapter of Jeremiah thirty one. It's very fascinating is an exposition of the new covenant, okay? Verse 22, Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen which ye went, uh, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall sanctify in you before their eyes. What? He's going to set the nation apart, Israel apart. He's going to clean them up. And guess what? Everybody's going to see it. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen, 
and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. That isn't accomplished until the millennial kingdom. That isn't 1948. That's none of that mess. Okay? Not, by the way, 1948 was when? 1948. So the dispensation of grace started with Paul in the, you know, in, back in the day, way before 1948. By the way, Hitler wasn't the Antichrist because that was 1940 or 30s. And we're still in what? The dispensation of grace. So this, verse 24, them being gathered, that's not going to start. That doesn't get accomplished. It starts, by the way, in the Acts period. They're getting it going, but then we interrupt it. Okay? I was. Now watch verse 25. Then. When? When is the then? When I bring you into your own land, when I gather you from the heathen and I bring you into your own land, when's he going to do that? Going into the millennial kingdom. So part of the second coming, there's events that he's going to accomplish in his second coming. One of those events is the establishment of the new covenant, ratification of it. Verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Sprinkle. Not immersion, not pouring. And what they do is they say, well, you got to pour, you know, you got to dunk them because they get a crazy idea about going, Peter or Philip goes down into the water and they say, see, he went down there and dunked him. And that's not in the passage at all. In Acts 2, they have a pouring out of the Holy Spirit, not pouring out of water baptism. How is this going to be done? It's going to be done by sprinkling. But watch what it's going to accomplish. Ye, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Water baptism is a ceremonial cleansing. It's a separate... It's separating them from the unclean, which is what? Their idolatry, the idolatry, the Baal worship. They're gonna, he's going to make water baptism, is, he makes a separation away, a separating from the issue, verse 25, your filthiness and your idolatry. Because what has polluted Israel? Well, that's the first 19 verses. <laughs> What did they do? Verse 20. And when they entered in, under the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of Israel and are gone forth out of his land. They profaned. When Israel engaged in idolatry, what did they do? They, they profaned. They sullied. They made God's name filthy and dirty. But with how? With idolatry. He says, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to separate you out. And I'm going to do it with water baptism. So water baptism is a cleansing, a purification from the, the association of idolatry. And it's going to be removed. Now, come, over, come back with me to Matthew 28. Okay? Matthew 28, and we're going to go there, and then we're going to go over to Isaiah. Water baptism, you will hear people say, it's just Jewish only. No, it's not. It's kingdom only. Because Matthew 28, look at verse 18. You see, water baptism is kingdom doctrine. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, that's the little flock, the nation of Israel, the believing remnant, therefore, and teach who? So who's that? Gentiles. What are you going to do to them? Baptizing them. Baptizing who? The Gentiles. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them. Who? Gentiles. So what are they going to be doing to the Gentiles? They're going to preach the gospel to them. The Gentiles are going to believe it. And then what's going to happen to the Gentile? 
they're going to be water baptized. See, water baptism has always been a kingdom doctrine. And who's in the kingdom? Believing Israel and the believing Gentile. Even Mark 16, go ye on all the world. I just had it and I biffed it. Boom. Go ye there into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized. That's not Israel. That's who? That's the Gentile that hears the gospel and believes the gospel. Now come back to Isaiah 50, 52. Isaiah 52. So water baptism is going to be extended to the Gentiles that are going to be going into the kingdom. But why baptize the Gentile, <laughs> right? Now, we know Isaiah 53, that's all about Calvary. But to get there, we got verse, we got 52, 52, 13. I feel like Peyton Manning, Omaha, 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 you know. <laughs> Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled, extro extolled and be very high. As many, as, uh, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. There's the cross. Now watch verse 15. So shall he sprinkle, well, what would that be associated with? Ezekiel 36, sprinkling of clean water. Sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. What's he going to do? with? He's going to sprinkle many nations. Think about, remember Leviticus 14, the leper? The leper is what? Unclean. What's the Gentile? Unclean. But if the leper is going to get healed, what's he, and he's going to come back, what does he have to do? He's got to be washed, cleaned up. What's the Gentile going to do? Be cleaned up. In Leviticus 14, go back with me to Exodus 19. The first thing that they have to do is they have to offer a sacrifice. They're going to take the two turtle doves and they're going to offer that sacrifice. And then they're going to be washed, cleaned up. And wa washing, sprinkling is that issue, again, it's the whole idea of to separate them away from the uncleanliness that's associated with Baal worship, idolatry, vain religious system. Now, Exodus 19, here's why we're, all this is even on board or in, in the picture here, okay? And why all of this applies to the nation of Israel while jo why, why John the Baptist is out preaching to nobody but the people of Israel, why out of Israel is called that believing remnant. Exodus 19, verse 3. And so Moses has brought Israel out of, of Egypt. By the way, they crossed the Red Sea, a picture of a dry baptism, because they go on in dry land. What are they doing? They're separating out from Egypt, the world, the picture of the world. So Moses, they get on the other side of the Red Sea. They go through five tests, the five Jehovah names. They fail them because they're, they're a mixed multitude. They're not all believers. There's, you know, they're, they're just glad we're out of Egypt. Verse 3, and Moses went up unto, the, un, unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, so he, they separate, he separated Israel out uh, of the world, Egypt. He separated them to himself. He set them apart. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's why on the chart, Israel sits on the top. They're what? Above. They're his people. 
okay? They're holy. They're peculiar. They're, se they're separated for the purpose that God created them for, and that was to be the rulers, the, the governmental structure of the earth. Verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. What are they going to be? A kingdom of priests. Well, that brings us to Exodus 29. Go over to Exodus 29. They're going to be a royal priesthood. They're going to be holy, a holy nation set apart for the purpose for which God created it, to be a kingdom of priests. So he's going to set them apart so then he would, they would take his word out to the world, to the Gentiles, because that's what the priests do. Now look at Exodus 29, because here's the priest, verse 1, and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them. Hallow, it's holy, set them apart. What are you going to do? To minister unto me in the priest office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. And what are they going to do? Okay, so you got an unleavened bread and some cakes. Verse 4, and Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the first thing they're going to do, so they've got the animal, the sacrifices, because they're going to have to make a sacrifice. But the first thing they're going to do to Aaron and his sons is what? Wash them with the water. First thing they do is wash them, baptize them, clean them up, identify Aaron and his sons as priests. Verse 7, then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. Or anointing oil, type of the Holy Spirit. So kind of think about this. Here you've got John the Baptist doing what? out baptizing, cleaning them up, washing them, and then you've got Acts 2 and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now, the crazy thing is, is when you go to Matthew 3, that's exactly what John the Baptist says is going to happen. Matthew 3, verse 11, John says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So not only is he going to, I'm baptizing you with water, John says, that water ceremony to clean you up and to get you established. But then he, here comes the Messiah, and he's going to nail you with the Holy Ghost, and he's going to nail you with the fire and, and burn you up if you, don't, if, you're on the wrong, if you don't believe what he's saying. So water baptism has every integral little part to what's going on. So, and it isn't just Jewish, it's kingdom. Because they're going to turn around and go right out to the kingdom nations in the millennial kingdom, preach the gospel of the kingdom, gospel of the circumcision, see them get saved, see them believe, and then be baptized. Now come over to 1 Peter chapter 3. Have I lost you yet? All right, hold on, I'm going to lose you now. <laughs> 1 Peter, uh, start, uh, do chapter 2 first. 1 Peter chapter 2. You see, water, by the way, in Acts 10, Peter goes to Cornelius. He's preaching. They believe. They get the gift of the Holy Ghost way before they ever were baptized. Peter goes, uh, I think we need to water baptize these guys. You know, they're speaking with... The speaking in tongues, the evidence of, you know, there he's like, and it says that th those that were with, of the circumcision that were with Peter were astonished because this isn't how this is supposed to work. And yet, that's how it was. 1 Peter 2, here's what Peter's, or what Peter's talking about. 2 9, but ye, by the way, 1 Peter is to the little flock as they're going to be suffering. And going into the, the 70th week of Daniel, he says, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Now notice, but ye are, not will be, not shall be, not were, but are. 
So as they're getting ready in Acts, the timing is clicking. And they're getting ready. And where are they headed? They're headed to the, through the tribulation, 70th week of Daniel, and into the kingdom. And he says, you guys are good to go. Now, keep reading verse 9. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Now, who's the people of God? It doesn't say Israel. It says who? The royal priesthood, the holy nation. Who is that? Luke 12, the little flock. If you're not little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or not. Now it mattered what? <laughs> you're in the little flock. See? Think, there's an expansion. There's a movement here. Verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from f- fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conversation, notice, honest among the Gentiles. What'd they do in Ezekiel? They profaned. Now we're going to be honest. Why would they be honest? Because what are, what are they doing? They're believing. They're believers. They're water baptized, and they're out there preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, come over to chapter 3, because here's where I'm going to lose you, but you just hold on, okay? Just read chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. And it's an interesting thing because that's what Peter's talking about. You go back in chapter 1, they're suffering. They're suffering. But look at verse 17. For it is better, if the, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you're going to suffer, at least be suffering for Christ's sake. Don't suffer because you're an idiot and you make dumb mistakes. Suffer for the right reasons. So we're talking about suffering here. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when... Once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, verse 17, uh, verse, uh, sorry, verse verse 19 and 20, they, man, you hear a lot of stupidity about that verse. When, you know what they say? They say that when Jesus died, he went down into hell And he was over there on Abraham's bosom, and he turned and he preached to the torment side. And then he went over there and liberated the torment. And I was like, what? He doesn't do any of that. That's theology, trying to push a doctrinal statement. Notice the verse tells you, because what they do is they get verse 19, but which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. By the way, the he here isn't the Lord, it's the Spirit out of verse, the end of verse 18, okay? But notice what verse 20 does, because verse 20 tells you when he preached to the spirits in prison. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. That's Genesis 6. So, and by the way, the long-suffering in the days of Noah, that's 120 years. The long-suffering of God, Genesis 6, verse 3. You see, what he did here was when he preached to those spirits in prison, wasn't at Calvary and the cross and death, it was back there in Genesis 6. But what Peter's doing is he's using this Noah situation as a picture. Verse 21 the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. You see, we got a picture here. He's like, guys, look, you're suffering. You're going through the tribulation. I know that. But think about Noah back here when all that was happening over here and Noah was suffering. What, did, what got Noah through it all? Well, what did Noah do? By faith, what did he do? He built an ark. 
God said, I'm going to come and I'm going to pour out my wrath on man. I'm going to judge the world. Build an ark. And those that believe this message of judgment's coming will get into the ark. And that it, I, that's, it's a picture. And it's a picture here that there's going to be eight souls were saved by water. So what happened to Noah is the same thing that's happening to you guys with the tribulation coming. Now look at verse 21 carefully. By the way, who lived in Noah's day? Those that got in the ark. Who died? Those who didn't. Baptism. Like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now watch the parenthesis. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Okay? So water baptism never, never, ever, ever, ever took care of their sin problem. What did it do? But the answer of a good conscience toward God. What did, what did water baptism? God's right. I'm wrong. And I'm going to go get baptized because that's what God's word tells me to do over here. Why did... Again, why didn't they get in the ark? They didn't believe. Faith. Why did Noah and his family get in the ark? They believed. They had faith. And what's happening here, again, the ark is the figure. What Baptism, the water. That's why Acts 2, you save yourself from that untoward generation. Get out of that apostate nation and get into the little flock. Baptism. Verse 21, it's a figure. By, by, by the way, the rest of verse 21, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Baptism is a ceremonial cleansing. And it's the response of faith to the word of God to them. And that little flock... They're over here. Save yourself from that untoward generation. Get out of that. Get identified right, and you're going to be baptized. So when you come back to Mark 16, because the hour's up, <laughs> all right? He that believeth and is baptized, believe the message. Get into the kingdom. Get into that little flock. What am I going to do? I'm going to go get baptized. By, by the way, if I don't, what's going to fall on me? The wrath of God. Okay, Moses tells Israel, I set before you death and life. Choose life. That's what they're doing. That's what the Lord's doing. That's what Peter's doing. I set before you death and life. Choose life. The issue of faith, trusting what God said, and then faith. their faith says, I'm going to go do what God said for me to do, and I'm doing that. What am I going to do? I'm going to get into a little flock. I'm going to get into the ark. And how, what's the door? Water baptism. Who's the porter? John the Baptist. I'm going to first step into becoming the royal priesthood is the issue of water baptism. So water baptism is a kingdom message, and it's how they're getting into the kingdom. They're being separated out from idolatry. Okay? Now, what happens is, again, then the verse says, shall be saved. And we'll talk about that next time because the hour's up. But salvation package, they were not always, a Jew never thought about dying and going to heaven. Actually, they'd never thought about any of that. <laughs> they just, they, they knew that they died, they would go to Abraham's bosom and then be resurrected back on the earth. Job says that. David says, talking about the little boy that, his baby boy that, uh, Bathsheba had that died seven days. He says, I'll see him one day again here in the flesh. Job says the same thing. I'll, meet my, I'll walk the earth with my maker. They never said, what, like we said, about dying and going to heaven. Why? Because it's not their message. It's not their realm. You went, so you can't take how we think about it and put it on them, and you can't take how they think about it and put it on us. You have to leave it separate. Okay. All right, so the goal here is to then look at the issues of saved and damnation and then look at the, the signs and the devils and the tongues and the serpents and the drink, the deadly, and just kind of look at what's going on because Mark is getting them ready for trouble. 
tribulation, 70th week of Daniel, how they're going to get through it all. But you have to be careful because he's also talking about the Gentiles doing the same thing. So when you hear people say, oh, only the apostles had the signs. Well, no, there were 70 that he sent out that could do the signs. And then here, there are Gentiles that will be able to do this as well. And we'll see all that as we go through. Okay? Because the little flock is already set. They're already there. And off they go. All right? Hopefully I didn't lose you too much. A lot of information, but you can work it through. All right? Okay. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word and look into the passage here. And really the relief to not place this on us today, but just to enjoy it where it sits for the little flock and for the believing Gentile and uh, the ability that you will equip them in the day, in that day, to be able to survive and to work through it and to come out and giving you the honor and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.